Hello and welcome. Assetto Corsa Competizione, released under Early Access in late 2018, recently received its first DLC pack. So I thought it might be time to create a getting started guide, and while at the same time figuring out some things for myself, since to be honest I've not spent a lot of time playing The Sim. While the title is to be published on consoles later this year, this video will focus on the PC version which you can purchase via Steam. I recently bought the DLC content as well and noticed there wasn't an additional download upon completing the purchase. So the additional tracks and liveries are, I assume, already installed and just need to be purchased. When looking to design a Seta Corsa Competizione, we'll refer to it as ACC from now on, the developers wanted to include day to night transitions and rain effects, which they have implemented using the Unreal Engine. And it is, I believe, the first driving simulator created using this game engine. The original Assetto Corsa was developed using the developer's own custom engine, and with mods etc is still going strong. Indeed, the Assetto Corsa community continues to add features long after the original developers have already moved on. And the use of the Unreal Engine does come at the cost of performance, or at least for those of us without the latest and greatest in hardware. However, those with high-end gaming PCs have also noted some performance issues. We'll include timestamps in the video description below, so you can jump to a relevant section should you wish to do so. We'll begin with some minor PC tweaks before starting to run the game. Of course your mileage may vary with any of these, but anything at all to gain a few extra frames of performance can't do any harm. We'll first set the PC to run in high performance mode. Search for control panel and once opened, if you haven't already, set it to show either the small or large icon list. Then look for power options, right click on it and choose create shortcut. Then from the desktop open the power options shortcut we just added. Note that some builds of Windows may not display the list of power plans shown here by default. So if you don't see them, select create a power plan. Choose the high performance mode and give it a name. Click next and then create. And then before running ACC, switch the PC to the high performance mode. And then using the power options shortcut we placed on the desktop, perhaps switch it back to the balanced plan when you're done. The next tweak is for Nvidia users only. I guess AMD users will have a similar option available. We'll add this while ACC is running. So to begin, boot up the game. Since we need to access the desktop again, if you like, you can quickly resize the game window by going to Options Video and set Full Screen to Disabled. And set the resolution to something low like 1280 by 720 and click Apply. Then right click on the desktop and select NVIDIA Control Panel. Then select Adjust Image Settings with Preview. And then select Use the Advanced 3D Image Settings and click Take Me There. Select the Program Settings tab and click Add. And with Sort by Recently Used selected, choose ACC and click Add Selected Program. And then, and these are just some examples, relevant for an NVIDIA GTX 970, set Power Management Mode to prefer maximum performance, set Triple Buffering to On, and Vertical Sync to Off, and click Apply. And then once you're back in the game, reset your resolution to the native resolution of your monitor. Of course, these NVIDIA settings are no miracle fix, but they are no harm to try. And if you have any other suggestions, please let me know in the comments below. And finally, an option I wasn't going to include, but I'll do so anyway, in case it helps somebody. While ACC is running, do Control Alt Delete and select Task Manager and then from the Processes tab, right click on ACC and select Go to Details. Then look for the 64-bit instance of ACC and again right click 
and then set priority to high and confirm the change. I thought of including this option if, for example, some are running apps alongside ACC, such as the Crew Chief and the browser or VR. And of course, Steam is always running in the background anyway. And this is something you'll need to apply each time you run ACC, as getting it to apply permanently is outside the scope of this video. Perhaps a good example to explain how process priority might help is the OBS app, where in the settings, you can set the process priority, and in this case from within the app itself, rather than manually each time as we just did. Of course, like any sim, you can play ACC with any controller you have at hand, a keyboard, a gamepad or a wheel. Here we'll be focusing on setting up a wheel, but many of the same principles will apply. To begin, launch the game and select options and then controls. In my example, for a Thrustmaster TSPC Racer, there are two profiles offered, TSPC Racer and F488. In my case, both required modifying, which is what we'll do in a moment. But first, let's check that our wheel and pedal inputs are set up correctly. We can load either of the example profiles as the wheel and pedal setup are the same, and then go through each input to check that it's being detected correctly. When I drove the first time under this new controller profile, I noticed that the force feedback was a bit too heavy, at least with the Trustmaster control panel settings in Windows set to their defaults. So I reduced the in-game gain to around 70%. There doesn't appear to be any kind of wheel rotation matching implemented here, which would allow you to match the actual wheel rotation value of the current car. So I had to set a rotation value in game such as 460 degrees, and then match that value in the wheels control panel in Windows. And then as a starting point, perhaps save this profile, which we can then modify later as we go through the rest of the control options. And before we continue, note, in case you need to refer to them later, the advanced options available to the right of each input access item. Along with the brake gamma settings. I'll include below in the video description a direct link to the section of David Perrell's video where he checks his pedal settings along with his race engineer, which is interesting. As I press the brake, look here, Chris. Can you see that? Uh, I'm pressing progressively. And then as yeah. I'm, now I'm really pressing as hard as I can. The, the purple. And in this case, David is using the new load cell based pedal set from Thrustmaster. And of course, if you are using a standard potentiometer based set like I am, the same principles will apply. The example TSPC racer profile assigns button 4 on my wheel to cycle the wiper speed and a HUD element at the same time. The F488 profile possibly relates to the Ferrari 488 which features a dual traction control system. David Perrell and I discussed it on the podcast and David and his race engineer Chris also covered the traction control system on the Ferrari in the video I just referred to. Although the 2019 Porsche 911 GT3R includes this dual traction control system as well. Overall, when it came to specifying the control bindings, neither of the example controller profiles were of any real use for me, so here's what I decided to do. I loaded the example profile for the TSPC racer and removed everything except the user interface related controls. You'll be navigating the user interface a lot, so it's maybe good to have these already assigned on your wheel as a starting point. In my case, buttons 3 and 5 are used for enter and back, 
and the D-pad on the wheel for up, down, left and right in the user interface. And buttons 9 and 10 are used to cycle through the car selection in the team's view. And if a car offers two or more teams or car numbers, you can use the same buttons to cycle through those as well. Cycle Hood MFD is useful to have to cycle through the left side controls element and where MFD is short for multifunctional display. And notice how we also use the D-pad to navigate this menu. And use Cycle Hood up or down to cycle the complete HUD selection up or down. To save a button on the wheel for something else, you could just cycle the HUD in one direction. So we'll remove the other assignment and then save this profile as a starting point. And then we return to the car system section. I use voice commands for a lot of these. There's a tutorial video on the channel. Or you may decide to use your keyboard or a button box if you have one. Or when starting out, you set engine start, wipers and the pit limiter controls as automatic, which you can do via options assists. And for example, once you get to the end of the first practice session in the career mode, the game will suggest a difficulty level to continue with and where each level includes a list of permitted assists. Note that it's possible to select another difficulty level other than the one suggested and then when you're ready you click apply. We can quickly test out some of the items here to see what it is they do. The wiper controls are obvious and the use of the dash and secondary display controls will vary depending on which car you are driving. For example, some cars like the Nissan appear to feature a single display. While the Ferrari appears to utilize a secondary display, which it utilizes in different ways, depending on whether you're in practice or race mode. So it might be an idea to create an additional control profile for those cars which don't feature a secondary display. We can quickly test, for example, starting a race in the Ferrari, and maybe we want to control the second display, but we don't have it mapped in the current control profile. If it's a single player race, or we're not in a hurry, press escape or the assigned pause button. Then go to options and controls, Load the profile we want to edit, save it and then return. For me, in both this and pretty much any sim, the car electronics are the first controls I assign. If I'm running the Ferrari 488, I'll use four buttons for the traction control system. And the same would apply to the 2019 Porsche 911 GT3R, which utilizes a similar system and two buttons for brake bias up and down. And as an example, I'll assign a single up control to ABS and engine map, if I find I'm not using those too often. Of course, I may decide to change those later, and I could of course create multiple versions of a final working profile, depending on which car I'm driving. The view section is an interesting one. You'll recall how we kept by default the D-pad on the wheel as up, down, left and right for the user interface. Let's assign the D-pad to the view controls as well to see what happens. Notice how when we cycle through the HUD MFD, our multifunctional display, as it's an element of the user interface, we can use the D-pad to navigate it, and when we cycle the HUD MFD to turn it off, the D-pad can then be used for the view controls. 
However, if we assign buttons 7 and 8 to control the field of view, those same buttons already assigned to control the ABS under electronics are removed. So it may take some trial and error to get things as you like them. Actually, I had been trying to get the same view controls working alongside the user interface controls using the same set of buttons on the wheel until I realized I could maybe just use the in-game view settings instead. So for example, when driving, press escape or your assigned pause button and select view settings and adjust the height, distance and field of view for the currently selected car. And here you can also select to include the wheel and driver's hands. And look with wheel allows you to rotate the camera when turning the wheel, which is an interesting option. I use track IR right now, so I've no need for it, but it's nice to have. I haven't yet figured out what dash cam factor actually is. And in terms of the rest of the controls, the lighting system controls can be mapped and used if set to manual in options assists. The advanced controls options I haven't yet looked at and you can also if you wish to assign a control to each level of traction control and ABS. And a side note before we continue, while creating this video, the 1.3.10 update added the ability to assign controls to each level of traction control cut and the engine map as well. And a final note on the controls. In the My Documents folder on your PC is where ACC stores its local data including any custom controller profiles you create. So make sure to back up this folder should you ever need to make a change to your PC. As we mentioned earlier, the use of the Unreal Engine to develop ACC has created some graphical performance related issues. Along with the PC tweaks I suggested earlier, I'll try and go through some of the graphics options I have been using as well. If anything, just to give an example of my own current settings. And as said, in all cases, your own mileage may vary. Unlike the control section, the video settings include some info on what each setting actually does, which is helpful. I'm running a 1080p 60Hz display with Virtual Sync turned off, as we assigned in the NVIDIA control panel as well, and I also disabled the frame rate limiter. The resolution scale option you can maybe try if your frame rate becomes really low, for example, when you go from practicing on your own to a race, and where having other cars on the track, along with weather effects, will eat into your performance. For me, with an NVIDIA GTX 970, viewing distances, shadows, anti-aliasing, Effects and any textures must be set to high or mid. Post-processing effects I set to lower in most games. And in driving sims, lowering the amount of opponents to be rendered may also help with your frame rate. Bloom effects are usually also lower or disable as well. Along with any motion blur effects. While out on track, it's possible to pause the game and go into settings to tweak your graphics options. Which I found myself doing quite often. You could try starting with one of the predefined graphics profiles and then keep an eye on your frame rate when in practice mode in clear conditions versus in a race in the rain at night. 
And when your frame rate drops, you could, for example, pause the session and select a lower graphic settings profile. The gameplay modes of ACC include Career, Single Player, Championship, Special Events and Multiplayer. Before we begin examining the various modes, we should first open the single player page and check the single player realism and assists sections. When you launch the game for the first time, both are set to beginner by default. Now let's start a career and notice how after the intro video featuring Mirko Bottolotti, the loading screen states that realism is set to beginner as you would expect. Then we'll click drive to start this new career session and if we press escape or our assigned pause button, we can check the career assists section. Now let's quit this career session and return to the single player settings and set the realism level to pro. We'll then start the career mode again and note that the loading screen now displays the realism level as pro. And again after selecting drive we can pause the session and go to options assists to examine the career assists once more. We'll customize them and click confirm and when we back out to the pause menu we select save to store our career assists settings. And now when we enter the career section again, we can choose to resume the career session we just saved. If we then return to the single player section, we can see that the assists are still set to beginner as we only modified the career related assists. We'll now apply custom settings to the single player assists. And note that the single player realism is still set to pro. We'll then go and start a new single player championship, selecting the Intercontinental Challenge, which we added via the DLC purchase. We can then check the assists before starting the session. Note how these are listed as championship assists, although these are the same assists we applied to single player just a moment ago. We'll then apply custom assists before starting this championship session. And then again, after selecting drive, we can pause the session, make a change to the assists and confirm. And when we step back, we click save to save this session and our changes. And then upon returning to the main menu and checking the single player assists, we can see the changes we made via the championship assists have been applied. And then if we quickly resume the career session we saved earlier, we can see that the career related assists we saved earlier are still intact. And if we return again to the single player page and check the assists section, the assists we applied in the career section appear to have been applied to the single player section as well, which I had not expected, as I was under the impression that the career related assists were separate from those specified for the rest of the single player modes. I guess if you plan to run career and single player modes simultaneously, it's perhaps good to check the assists before restarting a session. At least as far as I can tell, the realism settings applied in the single player page apply to both career and single player modes. When starting one of the special events, the assists specified under single player should be applied. And again, if we modify the assists here, they will be saved under the single player assists section. And if under single player, we set the realism to beginner to start a special event, the same settings should apply. The next item and an integral element of ACC, and perhaps the reason why many have purchased a copy of the game our player rating and online stats, which you'll find under Options General. These are set to on by default, and if you return to the main screen 
and examine your driver profile, you can check your current rating and stats. Selecting rating details your current driver rating. Note the text in the column on the right for more information. And if you go back and select stats, data on your progress across all tracks via both single and multiplayer is displayed. When rating is set to on, any time you spend on track contributes towards improving your online rating. Note that when you first start, for example, the career mode, your on-track competency will be measured and you'll receive information on how to improve your driving until you reach the first rating level. This happened for me during the third element of the career mode, I think. And from that moment on, you will see a reference to safety in the top right corner of the screen. Note that while you can replace your local gameplay storage folder to, for example, reset your career progress, you cannot reset your rating. And in order to increase your rating as quickly as possible, you may wish to start the career with your realism and assist settings set accordingly. If you then return to Options General and set Rating and Online Stats to Multiplayer only, then any local career or single player activity will no longer be measured against your online rating. In the Options Related Info on the upper right, it states that you can disable the ratings if you want to show the game to family or friends, which is perhaps a good example of where you might use it, or for just testing out your settings etc before starting to play the game proper. We'll then return to the main screen and select multiplayer. At this point, I haven't received enough of a safety rating to be eligible to enter the competition server. If I join any available multiplayer session, the safety rating data will be visible. When getting started, you'll perhaps want to increase your rating before joining some online sessions. Before joining a session, use the team element to select your car, remembering to use the cycle controls to cycle through car, team and car number selections. While I was creating this video, the version 1.13.10 update rolled out, adding a camera function to the car selection view, and I realized I had totally missed the car customization options, so we'll include those now. With a car selected, you can use your mouse to rotate it. And with a mouse wheel, zoom in and out. And then once visible, turn on the lights. Rotate to the rear to show the rain light and the indicators back and front. Open the doors and new in this latest version, the camera. Again, use your mouse to move around and mouse wheel to zoom in and out. And the assigned cycle buttons will allow you to move horizontally. To customize a car, click Add. Changing the cup value will change the related decal. And you can also add a car number and team name, where the latter will appear once you've saved your creation. Changing sponsor will change the decal on, for example, the wing, and again, you can use the mouse wheel to zoom in for a closer look and the banner is located above the windshield. You can also modify the paint color and finish of the body, accent and trim, along with the wheel rims as well. And then once you're done, you can again open the doors and examine your paint in detailed close-ups in the showroom.
And when you're done, return and click save. And your custom paint will then be added as part of that car's team selections. And the same applies to the matchmaking options. Use the cycle buttons to switch between preferences, tracks and weights. And note again that the last four tracks listed here are the DLC items. Under preferences, there's a reference to safety and racecraft ratings being on, but not yet implemented. Based on the preferences section description in the column on the right, it would appear that preferences when searching for multiplayer sessions don't yet include sessions with ratings, or at least if I've understood it correctly. I note that in the server list view, clicking advanced takes you back to the matchmaking options. As a side note on the multiplayer functionality, I was creating this video prior to the release of the 1.3.10 update, and after the update released, GamerMuscle was streaming the game on his channel, so I decided to join the server for a while. I can't comment on how things were before the update, but at least during this session, I noticed I was getting hit from behind, and the game would then state that the ratings of both drivers were being affected. We'll now take a look at the single player game mode. The interface is divided into three sections, mode, circuit and team. And note that above the circuit section, you can choose between the various seasons for 2018 and 2019. And if you own the DLC as well, the Intercontinental GT Challenge series. And these function as game modes within single player. So you could if you wanted to, assign different game modes to each item, such as practice to one, quick race to another and so on. And when selecting a circuit, the tracks relevant to the currently selected item are listed first. And notice how when you select the Intercontinental GT Challenge, that in the circuit selection, only the GT Challenge logo appears and not the years 2018 and 2019. We'll select 2018 and then look at the team selection. Selecting a car brand on the left opens up the selection available for that particular series or season. And each will then have its own associated teams and drivers listed, which we can cycle through or click the view. Once we have selected a car brand, team and driver, we can choose the circuit and in this example, we'll choose Barcelona. At this point before proceeding, it's probably good to mention that in single player, you can create any custom car and track combinations you like, such as the 2018 Blancpain GT Series Rover Racing BMW M6 GT3 at any of the Intercontinental GT Challenge tracks such as Bathurst in Australia. Whereas if we were to start a single player championship, we would need to select the 2018 endurance mode to drive the same Rover Racing BMW. And note also that with 2018 selected, the circuits are all European. And if we wanted to include Bathurst in a championship, we would need to select the Intercontinental GT Challenge mode and where you'll notice Rover Racing were not participating. And the only European circuit is Spa in Belgium. And now back to single player and the Intercontinental GT Challenge car selection. And of course in this example, we could choose Zandvoort in the Netherlands if we wanted to. And finally, the Blanc Pond 2019 car selection, where we could choose Suzuka. The realism and assists options we've already covered, and remember to check these before starting a session, if you happen to be mixing career and single player modes 
at the same time. We can specify the weather and track conditions all the way from clear weather to a storm. And finally the game mode, either practice, hot lap, hot lap super pole, hot stint, quick race, sprint race weekend, a 3, 6 or 24 hour endurance race weekend and finally a custom race weekend. I've never actually tried to start a 24 hour race event. And while we're on the topic of endurance racing, something I've been wondering about was pit stops, as there's no apparent request pit stop option in the controls like in other sims. In this case, the use of pit stops is limited to a maximum of one hour sessions. I'm not sure exactly why. And you can either disable pitting or set it to pit window along with pit window length or driver stint limit, which you can specify. So in this example, we'll use the custom race weekend option to specify a 24 hour event at Suzuka. Or at least we could if we had the time, which we don't. Now we'll take a look at the remaining options we haven't already covered. The audio settings are pretty standard for a sim. The only things I've adjusted so far was to turn off the music and user interface sounds. We've already looked at the general settings to disable the safety ratings while playing offline. The replay related options are also here. There's a maximum length of 75 minutes and auto highlights options as well. To be honest, I haven't investigated these in any great detail yet. Perhaps enabling replays might also cause a performance hit as well. I would need to try it. And if you do happen to enable replays, they will be accessible via the gallery on the main screen and listed under replays, highlights and automatically saved sections. And finally, the hood or heads up display options. Many of these, such as circuit map, virtual mirror and driver name tags are controlled using buttons in other sims, which is not an issue of course, unless you consider that in ACC, you're able to assign buttons to each level of traction control, ABS and engine map. Now I get it that drivers in some scenarios in the real world change traction control on an active basis, depending on which part of the circuit they happen to be on. And maybe these options in the game are something they added just because they can in a way, but I don't see myself using them anytime soon. Just a thought. A circuit map is useful to have when driving new tracks. I noted that the virtual mirror isn't allowed when in single player practice mode. Well, it isn't needed, I guess, since you're out on track on your own, but just to mention it, should anyone happen to wonder where it went to. And there's a proximity indicator, similar in a way to the Heli Corsa mod for Assetto Corsa. If you find that having the virtual mirror enabled affects graphic performance, you could consider disabling it and using the proximity indicator instead. And in relation to practice sessions, notice the racing practice info option, which might be useful. And as said, the enabling of driver name tags assigned to a button in other titles here is either always on or for multiplayer only. And finally, we'll take a look at setting up a quick single player session using some of the methods we've discussed. We'll enter single player and select the GT World Challenge 2019 season. Change the game mode to practice and select Zolder. Confirm the change and then select the car. We'll check the realism. Oh, and a side note for those not aware of the concept. Formation lap set to full lap or last corner refers to driving a lap of the circuit in starting grid formation before starting the race. And last corner means that you start from the last corner of a formation lap before starting a race 
as opposed to completing a whole lap. We'll then check the assists as well, confirm and start the session. We'll then quickly check the setup options. You can select a setup preset and examine it. Use the cycle buttons to switch between categories. And we'll quickly reduce the fuel load. Once we're done, notice the load save option on the lower right of the screen. We'll use that to try and save our change as a preset and then show how to load it. Then using the back button, we return and click drive. We then want to adjust our view. So we use the escape key or our assigned pause button and choose the view settings and adjust accordingly. Then click save and quit to return. Then select drive once more. Let's say we're not familiar with this circuit, so we want to use the circuit map. As we mentioned earlier, in other sims, there's a button to enable this. Whereas here, we would again pause the session and open up the HUD options, enable the circuit map, confirm the change and go back. I hope you enjoyed the video and it'll help you get started with playing Assetto Corsa Competizione. And if you did enjoy the video and indeed found it useful, I would appreciate a like on the video and uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And of course any comments or questions in the comment section below the video are always welcome. And also maybe share it with any family or friends who may also be interested in checking out the game. Until next time, thank you.